Hello, and welcome to Policy Conversations with Dr. P, an exploration of the district's anti-discrimination policies. My name is Dr. Provost, I'm the Superintendent of Schools, and I'll be your guide in this exploration of policy ACAC, which is the Prohibition Against Bullying and Harassment. Joining me today are Maddie and Levi, two students at Northampton High School. Would you like to say hi? Sure. Yeah, my name is uh, Levi Armstrong. I am a junior here at Northampton High School, member of the Student Union, and I uh, host a radio show. My name is Maddie. I am also a junior here, and I am one of the associate news producers of the transcript with Levi Armstrong. And we're also joined by Ms. Sarah Madden, the wonderful principal of Ryan Road School. Ooh, welcome. Glad everybody's here and tuning in. I'm the principal at Ryan Road School. I've been there for nine wonderful years and uh, consider it an honor to serve the community. Thank you. So uh, what's on your mind this morning? Uh, well, well, thank you for having us here, Dr. Provost, and uh, let's just get it started. So uh, let's take it uh, broadly to begin with. When was this policy written and how has it evolved to where it is now? Thanks for that question. So every policy ends with a list of legal references. If you look at this policy at the end, you'll see the very first one is something called an act relative to bullying in schools, which is a Massachusetts law that was passed in 2010. The goal of that law was to help schools develop a framework for creating more positive and supportive school cultures. That law was updated in 2014. Uh, there were many changes that were sort of minor around reporting because part of the law is that districts uh, are required to report bullying to the State Department of Education so that they can keep a, a tab on how things are going in the schools. Uh, but I think probably the most important change of the 2014 update was a recognition that certain in classes of individuals are more susceptible to bullying. For example, students with disabilities, um, students who belong to certain racial or ethnic groups, um, students who might be subjected to bullying on the basis of sexual orientation or sexual identity. And so the, the 2014 update really called out um, and, and asked districts to be very proactive in trying to support those students. So you'll see the, the next policy update that we had on this was in 2015 to incorporate those changes. So in terms of cyberbullying, um, what is the MPS understanding about what actions to take when it occurs outside of school? And, you know, it's just two students from the NH uh, MPS community. So the, the analysis that the district has to conduct in that case is something called nexus. Um, nexus means connection. So the, the question is whether there's a connection between the behavior that's happening online or outside of the school and something that could be happening within the school day. So, for example, if you had online bullying that um, was of the nature of saying, you're, you know, making fun of a student's appearance, saying if you, if you come to school, me and my friends are going to be, you know, are waiting to make fun of you, and because of that, the student um, stops attending school, is less likely to attend school, or is just fearful about coming to school and not able to get the full benefit of their education, then there's what we call a nexus between the activity that's happening outside of school and the education that the policy is meant to protect. All right. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I, in reading this policy, the um, Federal Education's Rights and Privacy Act came up quite a bit. Um, would you explain what that is and how it comes into play with this, uh, with this measure? Sure. So FERPA, or the Family Education Rights Privacy Act, is a federal law that protects the privacy of most student information. It comes up in the context of this policy because of the reporting requirements that are attached to the policy. So after a principal, such as Ms. Madden, investigates a claim of bullying, there's then a requirement for the principal to reach out to the parents, both of the alleged aggressor and the alleged target, to describe the findings and what's happening. In my experience, this is where some confusion can come in and where um, there can be some frustration around the policy. Often, the parents of the alleged target want to know what types of consequences the aggressor may, may have received from the school. However, 
those are, are federally protected private student records, and so we can't share that information with anyone other than the student's parent. So um, the, the alleged target's parent can know what um, measures are putting in place for the, the alleged target and their protection. The alleged aggressor parent can know what consequences we may have provided for that individual, but we can't share that information across lines. I don't know if um, you'd say that's fair or if you want to speak to that. Oh, I think it's fair. Um, and I think that what sometimes happens is that students end up sharing that information with one another. I mean, you hope that once you've gone through this process that there's some repair, at least in the elementary school, I know that my goal is to repair these, these situations, to make sure that it's a safe, a safe environment for everybody. And so sometimes a student might talk about that, and that, that's okay. You might want to say, oh, I got, I got suspended for three days for that. If that student wants to share that, that's fine. I think at the elementary level, we should protect those, those rights unless a student wants to share that. So the policy notes that uh, reports of bullying or harassment will be investigated to determine the incidents resulted in a potential or actual dis disruption of the school's learning environment. So who conducts these investigations and who makes sure they're done in a timely manner? I'm going to turn to Principal Madden again to speak to that one, since those investigations are conducted almost exclusively by principals. Um, so the most important thing that I try to do when I approach, when I hear about a, a bullying accusation, is to keep an open mind and to not um, feel as though what I'm hearing is going to be influenced by what I might have known about somebody prior. I really want to take in the information uh, with an open mind and to document um, what you're hearing. And so the first thing is to, to take, to listen. That's really important. You don't want to be telling the parent that, oh, I don't think it happened that way, or I'm sure that wouldn't happen, because that's really disrespectful and also goes against the policy. But you want to listen. Tell me what happened. I want to hear what you're concerned about, and you document everything. Anybody that might have been involved, it's really important to have all that information so that then I can sit back and think about, okay, who do I need to speak to to, to verify whether this happened, whether it didn't happen, who's in, who else is involved. I mean, there are a lot of different people that can be involved in these investigations. And so you want to be as thorough as possible. You don't want to not interview somebody because of time. You really have to devote some time to paying attention to a thorough investigation. Um, we also have cameras uh, that, you know, uh, that look at the outside. You know, is there, where did something, if it was an incident, is it something that I can, can look at a video camera and see if there was anything happening prior or during the event that I could also use in the investigation? And so you gather all that information and all your interviews. And then I will sometimes talk to, before I de determine whether or not it's bullying, I might talk to somebody else on my care team. That's my student, um, my school adjustment counselor or my tiered support person or my school psychologist to make sure that I'm reading the information as clearly and openly as possible. Um, and so really you just want to be as thorough and careful as possible so that you're not, you're just t dealing with the facts. <laughs> Well, so I'm curious on that measure. Um, if there's, if there is there a difference in the way that you take action? If it's a a, a physical bullying uh, a incident like hitting or something like that mm -hmm. versus uh, emotional, like you know, being mean to someone or using words. So the difference in 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 the sort of the consequence or how we deal with something does. Um, the age is, is more, more of, of what changes. Our job in the elementary school is to really educate um, students about how to take care of each other and how to be kind to each other and how to be safe in a community. And so with a kindergartner, if a kindergartner hits somebody, we're gonna deal with that differently than if a fifth grader hits somebody. And so, and, ha and have there been prior incidences that we've talked about you know, in the past, if there's you know, a pattern of, of of violence that's also different um, than if it's just happening. And I think there is misunderstanding about what bullying is. So if a kid gets hit on the playground, sometimes a, a caregiver will come to me and say, that, my kid's getting bullied. And they don't understand that, it, that it's just an act of unkindness. That's not that it can be ignored, but bullying is repeated targeted behavior. And that's the part that sometimes gets a little foggy for people to understand that if they're, you know, and so I have to really talk about what bullying is as opposed to that was a conflict or that was a really rotten thing that happened to your kid. It was the only, you know, the only time I'll certainly keep my eye on it. We, you know, we talked to the kids, they repaired 
their, their relationship, and I think it's fine, but I'm certainly going to keep my eye on it, is very different than a, a fifth grader who has had two, two other incidences, perhaps, and we've talked about it, and, and it was the same kid, and absolutely not. You know, that, that's a different level of Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um, well, Dr. Prubo, so on that measure, so in, so in the policy, it says bullying is defined in the Massachusetts general law uh, as a repeated use by one or more members of the school community of a written, verbal, or electronic expression or a physical act or gesture of any combination thereof directed as a target that, um, or directed as a target. Um, so does that mean that if it's just a one-time uh, incident that it's not necessarily reported as bullying, even if it's something that's really hurts a students uh, emotionally or physically? Yes, yeah, so that's that's the correct understanding, and I would like to follow up on something that Principal Madden just mentioned in her response to your last question, which is conflict. Um, so as I see the levels of behavior that we deal with in the schools, I conceptualize them as a continuum with three levels. The first level is conflict. That is disagreement between individuals. Sometimes that can even be violent conflict, um, but it's it's not necessarily bullying under this policy. Now remember, this is not just a bullying policy, it's bullying and harassment. So the second level of behavior is harassment. Harassment is a um, targeting an individual based on their membership or believed membership in a protected class, whether that be a racial group, an ethnic group, their status as an individual with a disability, et cetera. Um, that behavior is more concerning and is a higher level behavior because it's it's not just conflict between individuals, but it's conflict that's motivated by a animus against a specific group. Now that one doesn't have to be repeated, um, but again, that's not bullying. It's harassment. It's also it's also banned by this policy, but bullying is a behavior that doesn't necessarily involve targeting an individual based on their membership in a group but it's more significant and serious than conflict because it's repeated. It's happening over and over again, and that's what really is the difference between conflict, harassment, and bullying. Right. Um, in the district procedures, it mentions that there will be social emotional learning uh, and violence prevention instruction. Um, one, will this be uh, only after an incident, or will this be, um, or is this, you know, in the actual curriculum and also what would it look like like what is that instruction that's a great question um in the elementary schools of course that's what i know <laughs> know best uh, we focus an awful lot on social emotional learning and so it starts with um responsive classroom where you you that where that is a um it's a way of being together in a community, in a, in a school community, in a classroom community. You set values and goals and, and expectations and, um, about how you want to treat each other. And so that's sort of the basis of community. How are we going to treat each other and what, what are we going to do to make sure that that, that that happens? And so that's a basic level of social emotional learning. And we, we go back to, oh, did that just happen? Well, look, remember we agreed that we were going to be, be safe in the classroom. And so that's sort of a very uh, broad sense of how we want to treat each other in the community. We also have uh, programs that we use in, in morning meetings or in other parts of the day. We have Second Step, which is a, um, a social emotional curriculum, which talks about empathy and uh, do, um, regulating yourself when your emotions are, are elevated. We also have zones of regulation. I don't know if you, I don't know, if, oh, you must have had zones of regulation when you were there. So it's sort of recognizing, getting students and adults, quite frankly, to recognize how am I feeling? Am I ready to, to learn? Is there something I need? Am I getting anxious? Am I, you know, so, so that you can reach for, out for an adult for assistance if you need that. And so it's really, it's okay to be mad, but what you do when you're mad is, is what we really are working on teaching kids in elementary school. Um, and we, we really want to try to help kids to recognize how they can help themselves in those situations too. Right, so you, you mentioned that um, oftentimes when bullying is reported, it's, mm -hmm. it's usually come to uh, your attention. So Dr. Provost, I'm curious, as superintendent, um, how often are bullying cases brought to your attention? Or do are they mostly 
brought to and dealt by the principals and or members of the school where they happen. That's correct. They're mostly dealt with by principals at the schools where they happen. Under the policy, there's a report that I make on an annual basis to the school committee on the bullying incidents from the past year. So I do receive that information at the end of the year and share it. Um, there are times, especially, and I'll, I'll point this out, one of the changes that happened in 2014 that I think Northampton was ahead of the curve on is the 2014 updates um, made it clear that not only students were protected from bullying and harassment within the schools, but also other members of the school community, including employees. So sometimes when it's an allegation of bullying from one employee to another employee, then I may get involved in an earlier stage than I would when it's just student to student, because at that point there are um, employee rights that also come into play that sometimes the principals and I will have to consult about. As a member of the student union, it has been brought to my attention uh, several times uh, where people have come up with instances where the teachers were actually being kind of rude and, to their students, talking down at them. There was, uh, I know uh, it's also kind of an issue nationally. There was a story about a teacher who bullied another student based on his mask. Um, are teachers given training about how to be the most compassionate, caring, um, and understanding teacher to their ability? And what would happen if a teacher um, was reported bullying their student? So there, at the first day of school, there's something called mandatory training that we do. Actually, not the first day of school. The first day of work for teachers who come in a few days before the rest of the before the students come in, um, not just teachers but all staff, there is a uh, day that is dedicated to mandatory training. One of the mandatory trainings is bullying and harassment. So on an annual basis, we review the expectations for bullying and harassment. We review the staff's reporting requirements because remember, not only does this provide an opportunity for students who feel that they've been a victim of bullying or staff who feel that they've been a victim of bullying to report that, but it creates an obligation for all members of the community to report that if they know what's going on. So we do review that with staff as part of that mandatory training on an annual basis. I wanted to say something else about that. Another thing that I think is important is to know as a building leader sort of what's happening in classrooms. And so if you're sensing that a teacher is having a hard time for whatever reason, I mean, who knows what's happening in, in personal lives or in a particular class. So I guess I feel like it's partly my job to, to figure out if, if it's a healthy environment or not, and then if it's feeling like it's not, what can I do to, to sort of intervene to support that so that it doesn't come to bullying or to, to somebody feeling as though they're being bullied, you know? I mean, that's, I guess my goal, my, I feel like my job is to create an environment in a school where you don't need the policy, you know, where people are feeling honored and um, appreciated and respected enough that, that, they're, that they're coming to, pe that they have people to talk to. Uh, if a teacher's feeling particularly frustrated, they should be able to come to talk to, to, to me about, about that class, about that kid, or whatever's, you know, that's, that's the goal, is to not need the policy. It's important to have the policy so that everybody's clear what the rules are, but the goal is to not have to use it. <laughs> uh, so in today's, you know, political climate, there are a lot of people, especially students, that hold beliefs that could be can you know seen as controversial uh how are they still able to hold these beliefs and not be the victim of bullying or be uh, accused of bullying i think that's a really important question not just for students but for adults for every human being at this time um one of the things that has been really heartbreaking to me is to see what some people have referred to as the the breakdown of civility um, the idea that you can have a spirited exchange of ideas that may be very different, but still respect the person who disagrees with you. Um, and, or that you could have friends who have different political beliefs, different um, beliefs about a number of things, and still really love them, even though you really strongly disagree with some of the things they have to say. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it seems like that is is becoming less and less um, a part of life now. You know, if, as soon as as soon as someone disagrees with you, you're not friends anymore. 
you know, and that gets to the idea of cancel culture. You know, if someone says something that may be an unpopular belief among a group that they're shunned from the group and excluded from the group. And I, I really think that that is um, one of the more concerning trends that I see. One of the things that makes me um, less joyful, to be honest, you know, I, there was a time when, well, I'll just, I'll just say this, as a superintendent, I've worked in a number of very different communities with extremely different um, political beliefs. But one thing that was the same in all of them is everybody cared about their kids. Um, and I think that there's less um, reaching out to try to find the common ground and to try to find the ways in which people have shared values and more of a desire to sort of highlight areas of difference. Um, and I don't know where that's heading. Um, there was an interesting story on NPR yesterday. Uh, I forget what it was called, but basically they were talking about people are actually migrating within the U.S. to, to live in areas well, it'll be surrounded by people who have their, their same beliefs, um, which makes me wonder how people are going to understand what the perspectives of others are if they're sort of intentionally isolating themselves from different points of view. I think that's part of the role of the schools, right? Um, public education has been about trying to preserve a democracy, which is not necessarily a very um, stable or guaranteed form of government. And part of that is about having an informed electorate and informed citizenry who can exchange ideas and stay together as a, as a group. Um, so that, that question is much broader than this policy. I think that's, that's the work of every single person in our culture. Do you think the policy should be updated to, you know, help, uh, help with that issue? So this is about what's prohibited, right? Um, what I'm talking about is what's desired, which is, you know, creating um, bridges uh, of understanding across differences. So we don't necessarily uh, try to always outline what we're what we desire in terms of um, our educational goals within our policies. I think what you're talking about there is more of, of one of the goals that we have within our curriculum. If you look at the transfer goals of our curriculum, a lot of them have to do with understanding different points of view, understanding different ways of being in the world. And I think where we address that is through our curriculum. The hostile environment part of the of the uh, policy was what Maddie just asked about. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about um, uh, cyber harassment, which is defined as, quote, any willful and repeated harm inflicted through, but not limited to, web pages, social networking sites, email, instant messaging, or text messaging uses, using computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices, which is motivated by the target individual or individual's membership in a protected group, whether real or perceived. Uh, can you give a little bit more clarification about that and um, explain some differences between that and just cyberbullying? Sure. So I'll go back to the answer that I gave when um, I was expanding on Principal Madden's answer about conflict on the playground or in the school. Um, the difference between harassment and bullying really comes down to the membership in a protected class. So if the behavior is based on um, animus towards a certain group, then it's harassment. If it's repeated targeting of an individual that's disconnected from their real or perceived membership in any protected group, then it's bullying. Is that clear? Yeah. Whether in person or on an electronic device. Right. Um, do you think that this policy will work for all elementary, middle, and high school, or do you think it's going to need to be tailored for each event or each grade group? Yeah. I think it certainly works. I mean, uh, we've been using it, and I feel like it's an, it's a, it's a, an important policy to have, but how you implement the policy might differ in elementary, middle, or high school. Um, and so I think it's, it's the way in which it's not that you are veering from the policy, but 
in elementary school, you're really um, trying to teach people about, about what's in the policy. You know, by the time you're in high school, if you give somebody the policy and explain it, you expect them to adhere. You, you know, this is important. You understand, you know, maybe they need more extra instruction. But in an elementary school, we want to teach what's in that policy, but not give them the policy. <laughs> that would be, you know, too much information. But really, it, when somebody, this just happened yesterday, somebody was critical of somebody else eating meat because they mm. were a vegetarian. And it became this big, you know, I was in the, in the lunchroom and it became an argument. Um, and uh, it was, you know, and so I, that, that's where this starts, right? Um, is how, how do you sit at the same table and respect each other and not comment in a negative way about what somebody else is eating when you feel so vehemently about being a vegetarian or not being a vegetarian? And so it's just so interesting that it, it seems like it's a, um, a little thing, and yet it's not, because the how you handle that, if I had said, stop, 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 it's all the noise, and didn't address what was being discussed, then I'm not helping a community to, to, to grow in terms of ac acceptance and respect and everything that we want that this policy to, to, to deal with. And so it's dealing with everything that you hear in all of these kinds of uh, situations that, that I think help to make it a, a, a policy that's usable at all levels. But you, you might not deal with that conversation at, in the high school. I don't, but I, I wouldn't let it go in an elementary school because it's a teachable moment to, in terms of everything that we've been talking about today. Right. So, so Maddie was just talking about tailoring the uh, policy, which brings me to another question. So in the district procedures uh, tab, it mentions that a set amount of time where within parents will be notified of the complaint and another set amount of time for the investigation to, to take place. So would this time be tailored um, if it's if it's one case versus another in which one might need more time to gather data, collect witnesses, whatnot? And, um, and uh, what is the average amount of time that, that it takes? Mm. So it, the, for me, the amount of time depends on how many people are involved. And, and so it could take a, so it's not really what happened, but how many people I need to take time to interview, because it's not the only thing I'm doing in a day. And so I just try to make sure to communicate. So if I'm realizing, oh, this is getting more complicated, this is involving more people, it's gonna take me some more time, I just have to communicate with the family who placed the complaint to, or the child and say, this is taking me a little bit more time. This is where I'm at. I'm going to make sure to be done with this by X. So, so there's not an outlined amount of time, but I think you have to be respectful to whoever's placed the complaint to, um, to communicate with where you're, where, where you're at. You know, I don't want to say, well, I'm, you know, I don't want to, and then they have to call me and say, oh, where are we at with that? And I'm thinking, oh, I didn't do anything with that. I, that's not, you know, not acceptable. But to communicate about where you're at with it seems to be reasonable. So when you guys mentioned, you know, being friends despite political beliefs, it kind of reminded me of my friend Levi because we are very different. Uh, we hold very different political beliefs. But we are still very good friends. Oh, I think I think it brings up an interesting point that you're very good friends. And I think that that connectedness is probably what keeps you keeps you going. And I think that the most important thing we can do in schools is to make sure that people are connected with other people that those relationships that we, that we build and that we foster in a community are vital to kids feeling valued and happy. Uh, and when anybody, kids or adults, are feeling positive and confident and happy, they're not going to harass or, or bully, you know? And so our mission is to make sure that, we're, that we are trying to nurture people who are going to connect with other people because that's what keeps us, you know, that's, that's what's gonna keep us connect in, connected in a good way, the where you're respecting other people, where you're listening to other people. It's the sort of building those relationships are so important as we as we go through school. And I think you're right, the public school, where you bring together a whole diverse uh, group of people, is the place where we can make sure that that happens. Absolutely. Right. I, I, I think the most important thing two people can do is have a conversation, an honest conversation where there's no yelling or or accusations. It's just trying to get down to, okay, I think this, you think that, let's let's have a conversation about it so that we're not calling each other the other person, we're, we're friends about it, and we can come to a common understanding where we both um, either agree to disagree or we can, or we can 
try to explain to the other person why we think that, but not be rude about it or mean about it. Just explain your side and they explain their side. And then, and then that's the end. Cause there's a lot more you can do than just talk about, you know, politics and whatnot. It's there, there's so much more two people can do than, than just be mean to each other. Thank you very much. And thank you for this conversation. I have to say that you, as well as you, Principal Madden, give me great hope for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.